The book of Romans, chapter number 9. Uh, also pray for Timothy. Timothy has an earache, and he's going to the doctor tomorrow. Uh, October is usually uh, one of Timothy's worst months health-wise, but uh, he's, doing, he's doing better than he used to in previous Octobers. But uh, do pray for him, if you would, as he goes to the uh, doctor tomorrow as well. And uh, uh, also, again, I just want to re- say again for the teens, lift them up to the Lord in prayer. Just every time you think about them, uh, le- leading up to this Sunday, pray for them. Just pray that God will use them. I came from a church. Uh, I came from a church when I was a teenager that most of the workers were teens, and uh, that I, I don't know that that's necessarily the way it should be, but that's the way it was. And uh, most of the teens were busy either as a bus captain or teaching a Sunday school class. And and uh, I, I'm I'm, bur- I'm burdened. I truly am. Not that the uh, uh, the adults step back and let the teens take over. We don't want to do that. We want to show them the way. But I am burdened for the teens that they learn to serve God now. That they learn to to walk with God now. That they uh, have a, have a uh, uh, service for the Lord now, and uh, we want them to have a balance between being under the preaching and serving the Lord. And so I want to encourage as many teens as possible to get involved, and especially this Sunday with that special uh, teen Sunday. Romans chapter 9, and again, uh, there's a, a lot of verses, and I feel like last Wednesday I, g- I got into too many verses. I just feel that I did. I really do. Uh, I, I want to try to keep it uh, a little more simple this week. The bottom line of Romans chapter 9 is this, that when the Bible talks about election, it's not talking about God choosing some people for salvation and some people to be lost. The Bible, as we saw last week, is very clear that God gives every man a free will, that every man makes his own choice. Every lady makes her own choice. In fact, uh, turn over one chapter, Romans 10. We use this verse often when leading somebody to Christ. And notice what it says in Romans 10, 13. It says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And we saw several verses last week showing that uh, anybody who wants to be saved the Lord will save them. The Lord wants every man saved. What is God's will? Second Peter 3, 9. He makes it very clear. The Lord is not slack. Concerning His promises, some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all. Now that word all is all-inclusive. All. Uh, it's an absolute. That all uh, I, I just missed what verse I was reading. Second Peter three nine. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any there's an absolute should perish, but that all another absolute should come to repentance. God wants everybody saved. Uh, let's look at one that uh, we didn't look at last week. I, I think I mentioned it, but let's look at it for a minute. First Timothy. Look at First Timothy, please. And uh, look at. Uh, chapter 2, 1 Timothy chapter 2, and by the way, I, I bring this up as well because we are, there is a presidential debate tonight, and uh, I, if you're like me, you're, you feel like you should watch it just to be informed, but you're, you're not relishing the thought of watching it either. That's kind of where I'm at on it, and uh, I'm, I'm truly praying for our nation, just praying that God will work something out through this process But again, we're reminded that the answer for our nation isn't in the White House, and it won't be in the White House. Uh, It doesn't matter who drops out or who gets elected. The answer is not in the White House. It's still in the church house. But notice what the Bible tells us to do as Christians. 1 Timothy 2, verse 1. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. So he says, first of all, pray for everybody. But then he gets specific, verse 2, For kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Do you pray for your congressman? Do you pray for your governor? Do you pray for your president? Do you pray for your vice president? The scripture teaches us we're to pray for all that are in authority. Verse 3, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Look at verse 4, Who will have all all men to be saved. How many people does God want saved? Everybody. 
Does God want uh, uh, Hillary Clinton saved? The answer, absolutely yes. Does God want Donald Trump saved? Absolutely yes. Does God want, what's the third guy's name? What, what's that guy's name? Anyway, the guy, Gary Johnson. Does God want Gary Johnson saved? Yes, he does. Uh, does God want our governor saved? Our governor is saved. Praise the Lord. Does God want our current president saved? Yes, he does. God wants everybody to be saved, verse 4, and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for, what's the next word? For all, verse 6. He gave himself a ransom for all. He wants everybody saved. Now again, I want us to see that balance of Scripture when we go back now to Romans chapter 9 so that we understand that when we read about election, it is not talking about one person God chooses to be saved and one person God chooses to be lost. Folks, every person has a free will and God allows mankind to make their own choice. But what God did do is God did elect and choose. That's what elect is. It's choosing. He did choose specific people through whom He would bring His Son and by whom He would complete uh, his, his goal of bringing His Son into the world. Who did He choose? He chose Abraham, we saw last week. He chose Isaac. He chose Jacob. Uh, he chose those men specifically. Why? Because of something that they were? Because of some great character that they had? No, but because of who God is, because it's His plan. He chose Abraham. He chose Isaac. He chose Jacob. He chose the nation of Israel. Why? Because they were great and holy and mighty? No, because it was part of His plan. God chose the people uh, that He wanted to bring His Son into the world, and those people were the Jewish people. So were the Jewish people blessed? Absolutely they were blessed. They had great advantages that much of the rest of the world didn't have. But because of those advantages, those Jews just assumed that they were good with God. They just assumed that because of uh, their Jewish law and because they were doing their best to keep their Jewish law, that God was impressed and somehow was giving them salvation. But what Paul is making clear is that there is no salvation outside of Jesus Christ. Remember what Jesus said to the Pharisees. He said, search the Scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they didn't. He said, but these are they which testify of me. Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. And that's what Paul is making clear in Romans chapter 9. Now, we've read several verses. Uh, let's go down and we're going to begin in verse, uh, verse 14. The Bible says, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy... On whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion, on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Let's pray. Lord, open our understanding, open our hearts, Lord, to see the wisdom of your word. To understand, Lord, that election has nothing to do with our salvation, other than the fact that you chose specific people through whom to bring your Son. Show us, Lord, that there is a, a message of the gospel that is for whosoever will. But it's not a whensoever gospel. Help us to understand that tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Remember again, the gospel is a whosoever gospel. But it is not a whensoever gospel. God offers every man light. God offers every man truth. But God doesn't offer it all the time. Uh, when a man finally rejects God's Word and turns against the Holy Spirit of God and turns against Jesus Christ and dies in his sin, it's too late for that man. By the way, folks, this is what ought to terrify every lost person when they come into a service and they know the Holy Spirit of God is dealing with their heart, but they put off salvation, that they ought to be shaken to their very core because the Holy Spirit doesn't promise to always strive with man. As a matter of fact, there is a time when God, as He did with Noah, shuts the door and the opportunity is gone to be saved. Folks, when a person hardens their heart over and over and over again to God and to the gospel, it very well may be that God will harden that person's heart. And this is exactly what happened with Pharaoh, and we're going to see that right now. Look at uh, Romans 9, verse 15 again. 
For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. It's God's mercy that offers this salvation. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose, have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured, don't miss this, endured with much long suffering, the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. Stop right there and let's think about the story he just mentioned, the story of Moses. Think about Moses. The Bible says that uh, Moses, uh, when he was come to years, he re- Fused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God, that's the Jews, than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. What happened? Uh, the Egyptians enslaved the Hebrews. Remember when Joseph and the Jews and the, he- the Hebrews moved down into Goshen, into the best land of Egypt. Remember when they moved down into the best land of Egypt and uh, they were there and serving Pharaoh and, and living off the land, but another Pharaoh rose that didn't know Joseph. And so what did he do? He took the children of Israel and he enslaved them. And he made their lives hard and he made their lives bitter. And for over 400 years, the children of Israel were slaves to the Egyptians. Now the children of Israel, their, their lives were hard, and God appears to Moses. Remember Moses, who had been raised in Pharaoh's home. Uh, he uh, go, goes uh, down to see his brother, see his Hebrew uh, uh, friends and Hebrew uh, uh, family to see how they're doing. And when he goes down to see them, he sees an Egyptian beating one of the Hebrews. Well, what does Moses do? Moses says, you know what, I'm not going to put up with this. I'm a Hebrew. And he looked this way and he looked that way. And he thought he would begin the deliverance. And he killed the Egyptian and he buried him in the sand. Well, not very long thereafter, somebody said to Moses, uh, they, they were fighting with each other. And Moses said, hey, you Hebrews, stop doing that. You're God's people. You're brethren. Stop doing it. And one of them said, what are you going to do? Kill us like you killed that Egyptian? Moses went, uh-oh. This thing is known. And he went and he ran out into the wilderness and the word got to Pharaoh and Pharaoh said, I'm going to take care of Moses. Good thing for him, he ran to the wilderness. How old was Moses when that occurred? He was 40 years old. And so he runs out into the wilderness and he thought at 40 he was ready, but he wasn't ready. God had 40 more years of training for him. Now think about that for a minute. That's a long time in college. Josh, imagine if you went to school for 40 years. Forty years he went to the backside of the wilderness working for his father-in-law. Forty years. He became the meekest man that ever walked the earth, the Scripture says. One day he's out there tending the sheep and he notices a sight and he sees a bush that's burning but it's not being consumed. And as he approaches the bush, he hears the voice of God Moses, draw not nigh hither, but remove thy shoe from off thy foot from the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. And Moses realized he was speaking with God. God said, Moses, I'm going to take you the way you are right now. And I'm going to use you to deliver my people, the children of Israel, out of the hand of Pharaoh. And we know the story. Moses protested over and over and over again, saying, God, I can't do it. God said, look, here, I'm going to show you you can do it. Moses said, God, I can't do it. God said, Moses, you can do it. God, I can't do it. Send somebody else. God, Moses said, God said, Moses, you're the one to do it. So finally, after all that talking, what happens? Moses appears before Pharaoh. And he says to Pharaoh, Pharaoh, thus saith the Lord, Jehovah, the God of the Israelites, 
The God of your slaves. Now put yourself in Pharaoh's shoes for a minute. The God of your slaves says, let my people go. Now folks, here, here is where the gospel comes in. The gospel is a whosoever gospel. God offers every man the opportunity to see things his way. And so God comes to Pharaoh and says, uh, Moses comes to Pharaoh representing the Lord and says, let my people go. What does Pharaoh do? He hardened his own heart. He had a choice to make. He could submit to God's will or he could in stubbornness and pride refuse what God had to say. And that's what Pharaoh did. He hardened his heart and said, I don't even know who the Lord is. Multiple times Moses and Aaron appeared before Pharaoh and eventually they brought the ten plagues upon Egypt. But notice what happened, and we won't look at every single reference. I'd encourage you to go read it sometime. But what happens is first, Pharaoh hardens his own heart. First, the, the, notice the scripture says uh, these, uh, these vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. Folks, who fitted Pharaoh to destruction? Did God design Pharaoh? Was Pharaoh born into the world so that he could be condemned to hell? Absolutely not. God offers salvation to every man. But who fitted Pharaoh to destruction? Here's the answer. Pharaoh fitted himself to destruction. This is what Jesus was telling the Pharisees when he said, you think you have eternal life in the Scriptures. He said, read them again. They, they're testifying of me. The Bible says God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Why? Because the world's condemned already. And God sent this message to Pharaoh saying, let my people go. Now here's where mankind's pride enters. Well, wait a minute. God, what's so special about the Jews? Put yourself in Pharaoh's shoes again. What's so special about these Jews? I mean, us Egyptians, we're far better than the Jews ever were. I mean, if anybody should have their will done, it should be the Egyptians. I want my will done. I don't care what your will is, God, and I don't know even who you are. And so, Moses, no, of course I'm not going to let the people go. They're my slaves. They're building my cities. I'm going to harden my heart. I refuse what God has to say. Pharaoh made that choice. He had multiple opportunities, multiple opportunities to see things God's way. He had multiple opportunities to humble his heart and get rid of his stubborn pride. But instead, what did he do? He continually fitted himself to destruction. He continually used his own free will to refuse the will of God. And so what happened? That whosoever will message for Pharaoh, the door closed on Pharaoh. Because as I said, the gospel is a whosoever will gospel, but it's not a whensoever will gospel. The Bible says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. God will have His way. God's will will be done with or without us. And Pharaoh hardened his heart. Again, some would say, Well, well God, it's not fair. How come the Jews were such special people that they were your people? That's God's plan. Why couldn't it have been the Italians? Or the Grecians, or the Australians, or the Americans. The fact is, God made a choice. He elected the Jews. Folks, that's what election refers to. He elected the Jews. He chose the Jews to bring His Son into the world, to be a blessing to all the world. But because of Pharaoh, Pharaoh being a perfect example, because he fitted himself to destruction and hardened his own heart, God then hardened Pharaoh's heart, and Pharaoh became an illustration of what happens when you refuse God's will. And God's people became an illustration of what happens when God's mercy is shown. God delivered the children of Israel not because of their goodness, but because of His goodness. Listen to this quote. God's mercy is not extended as a recognition of human will. Nor is it a reward of human work. It is solely based upon the character of of God. God is going to do His will. 
And you have a choice of whether or not you bow to his will. Now or later. You see, now we bow to his will as our Savior. Someday, those who don't bow to Jesus Christ as Savior will bow to him as judge. The Bible says, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So again, when you read about election, he's referring to specific people God chose to bring his gospel, his good news into the world. Now notice again, verse 22, what if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering? The vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. Folks, the Bible says God is angry with the wicked every day. He has no, the Bible says in the book of Ezekiel, He has uh, no desire, He has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He gets no pleasure out of the wicked dying and receiving the judgment for their sins. And He's angry with the wicked every day. But His long-suffering, as 2 Peter 3, 9, His long-suffering extends mercy. So that man can be saved and see things God's way. Romans 4, 5 says it very clearly. The Bible says that, Knowest thou not that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? Notice verse 23, And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had afore prepared unto glory, even us whom he hath called, Not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. This was one of the great mysteries that the Jews didn't understand. They thought their Messiah was coming for them, for the Jews, because they were God's chosen people. But what the gospel shows us and what is referred to as a mystery in the New Testament is that the gospel and the Messiah and the Christ wasn't just for the Jews. Thank God for that. Amen. How many of you are Gentiles? All of us should raise our hand. I don't think we have any Jews in here tonight. We're Gentiles, and the gospel's for us. Notice verse 24, Even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles, as he saith also in O.C., which is the Greek word for Hosea, it's the, the Greek name Hosea, as he saith in O.C. or Hosea, Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people. And her beloved, which was not beloved. If you remember the story of Hosea, it's a very interesting story. Uh, almost, a, almost a bizarre story. God, it is a bizarre story. God tells the prophet Hosea, he, he tells him to go, go marry this uh, lady who is a woman of ill repute. Uh, a, a harlot. And uh, they, he marries her and they have a child together and he names the child. Well, then the next two children, Hosea is not even sure if they're his children. And so the names he gives to these children show that he doesn't even know if these are his people or not. But God was showing an illustration. He was showing a picture how that God's people, the children of Israel, had gone so far away from God, but yet God was committed to them. And here he says about the Gentiles, verse 25, I will call them my people which were not my people and her beloved which was not beloved. You can read that in Hosea 2.23 and Hosea 1.10, verse 26. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, speaking of Gentiles, there shall they be called the children of the living God. You can read that in Isaiah 10, 22 and 23. But we're going to look at one passage ourselves. Keep your finger here. Look at 1 Peter 2. We're close to that passage. 1 Peter 2. Look at verses 9 and 10. The early church didn't understand this at first. They didn't understand that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the the King, wasn't just for them. He was for us. He He had come to save the entire world. Look at 1 Peter 2, verse 9. The Bible says, But ye are a chosen generation. Notice that word chosen again. Just like God's children, the children of Israel, they were chosen. They were elected of God. They were elected to bring the Savior into the world. We as God's people by faith, we're children of Abraham by faith. The moment you got saved, the moment you said yes to Jesus Christ, you became a part of God's people. 
But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtain mercy. How do we obtain mercy? Is it by God choosing some of us to be saved and God choosing some of us to be lost? No. God offered mercy to every man. When you said yes to Jesus Christ and He saved your soul, you obtained mercy through Jesus Christ. Notice back in Romans chapter 9 again. It shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Look at Acts Chapter 15, Acts chapter 15, verse number 17. Acts chapter 15, look at verse number 17. In fact, look at verse, uh, uh, verse 11 just for some, uh, some context here. It says, but we, but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Who, who, who's the they they're talking about? Us, the Gentiles. Notice uh, verse, uh, verse 12. Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. And after that they held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for His name. And to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written, After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things, known unto God are all His works from the beginning of the world. From the very beginning, when God chose Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and chose the Jewish nation, He didn't choose them exclusively. He chose them for the benefit of the whole world, including the Gentiles. Verse 19, Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. Look back in Romans chapter 9 again. Verse 27, Esaias... That's Isaiah, again, the, the Greek uh, name for Isaiah. Esaias also crieth concerning Israel, Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. Now notice that. Remember again, the children of Israel were God's chosen people. Does that mean they were saved? No, many weren't saved. In fact, many of them, uh, the Scripture says here, though, the, though they be as the sand of the sea... Just a remnant is saved. Again, were the Jews blessed? Yes, they were blessed because God sent the gospel through them to the world. But folks, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew. It doesn't matter if you're a Gentile. It doesn't matter if you were raised in church or your parents are Christians. It has nothing to do with whether or not you're saved or not. Whether you're religious, whether you try your best to keep the laws of God, none of those things have anything to do with salvation. You could be baptized, you can receive communion, you can come to church every time the doors are open. Uh, your parents can be good, godly Christians, and that doesn't make you saved. Each person must obtain mercy from God through Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul is emphasizing here to these folks. Yes, the Jews, they were elected. Yes, they were chosen to bring the Savior into the world. But just having those special blessings did not make them Truly saved. Only through Jesus Christ can anyone come and be saved. Notice verse 28. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. And as Isaiah, as Isaiah again said before, except the Lord of Sabaoth, that's the Lord of hosts, had left us a seed we had been as Sodom and been, been made like unto Gomorrah. He said, if God hadn't have spared a remnant of us, we would have been totally destroyed like Sodom and Gomorrah. We're talking about the chosen elected nation, the elected people. Notice 
verse 30, what shall we say then? Don't miss this. That the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. This is the same theme Paul has been speaking over and over and again in the book of Romans. The Gentiles that didn't have the Jewish law, the Gentiles that never had the tabernacle or the temple to worship in, the Gentiles that didn't receive from the hands of God God's law written in stone tablets, the Gentiles that didn't have the prophets ended up becoming the people of God. How? Through Jesus Christ, the same way anyone becomes a child of God. Notice, it's the same thing what Paul said in the book of Philippians. He said, I want to be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. By the way, parents, you're just your children having a good godly heritage what doesn't make them saved. They need to have their own relationship with Jesus Christ. They need to claim Him as Savior for themselves. Notice again, verse 30, What shall we say then that the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith, what righteousness is that? It's the righteousness that Jesus earned on the cross for us. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. It's the righteousness that only comes by trusting Christ. Verse 31, but Israel, the chosen nation, the elected nation, which followed after the law of righteousness hath not attained to the law of righteousness. What is he saying? They've been trying to get to heaven by their works. They've been trying to impress God by keeping the law, and they haven't kept the law. No man has. Verse 32, Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. Now don't miss this, we'll be done. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. Verse 33, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Sion a stumbling stone and rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Folks, many times when giving the gospel, witnessing to somebody, you show them the first couple of points where the Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The bad news is, because of our sin, we don't deserve heaven. The second part of the bad news is, because of our sin, we deserve hell. But the good news is this, that the Bible says that God commendeth His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And then that same verse that said, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Have you ever witnessed to somebody and you've gotten right to that point? And you ask them the question, you say, now when it says a gift, that means one person pays the full price and the other person just receives it freely by grace. And then you, you might ask them the question. I like to ask them the question. I'll say, hey, you've no doubt bought someone a gift before and when you buy someone a gift, how much do they have to pay you for that gift? Well, nothing. It's a gift. That's right. And the bigger the gift, the bigger the price. And then you might say something like this to them. What I want you to understand is if you're going to get to heaven, the only way you can get there is by receiving eternal life as a free gift. And you know, a lot of times when you tell folks that, they stumble over that. They trip over it. Jesus and only Jesus... I mean, surely there's some way I can earn my way to heaven. Sure, Jesus, maybe He made the down payment, but I've got to do something in this thing. Folks, there's nothing you can do to impress God. 
There's nothing you can do to pay for one bit of your sin. We are all as an unclean thing. And all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And what that message does is it flies in the face of our pride. Because we want to think somehow, some way, we can impress a holy God. And folks, there's absolutely nothing in us that can impress a holy God. We are sinful to the core. The only thing that can impress a holy God is what His Son did on that old rugged cross. How He died, was buried, and rose again. And Paul said, that's what the Jews are tripping over. Because they're still hanging on to their pride. They've got the law. They've got the prophets. And they feel like their works are earning them something. But he said it's not earning them anything. The only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. He is the way. 1 Peter chapter 2, we'll be done with this. Look at 1 Peter 2, verses 6 through 8. It refers to that cornerstone, that stumbling stone, that rock of offense. Again, if man, if we came up with our own plan of salvation, no doubt we would somehow come up with some way we could work ourselves to heaven. We'd come up with some way we could give enough or be enough or do enough, but that's not what God did. God did it in such a way that only He can get the credit, only He can get the glory. Look at 1 Peter 2, and uh, I'm, I'm in 2 Peter, that's why it doesn't read what I'm looking for. 1 Peter 2, verses 6 through 8. Wherefore also it is contained in the Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. Let's bow our heads together, please. Hi, everybody. This is Tim DeVries, pastor of Vision Valley Baptist Church in Mount Washington, Kentucky. And I want to thank you for watching our YouTube channel today. Our desire is that the world know Jesus Christ as Savior and that in this generation, His people will be faithful, uh, courageous, bold witnesses for Him. I want to say to you, if you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, God loves you and wants you to know for sure that you have a home in heaven. In order to know for sure you're saved and that you're going to heaven, the Bible tells us we need to know, first of all, that we're all sinners. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Because of our sin, we don't measure up to God's glory. God is perfect, but we are not. And sin keeps us out of heaven. Secondly, the Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. The scripture says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Revelation 20, 14 and 15 says, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. You're going to spend eternity somewhere. And because of our sin, we don't deserve heaven. Unfortunately, we deserve a devil's hell. But the good news is this, that God loves us. And because he loves us, he made one way of salvation. It's not through a church. It's not through a religion. It's not through doing the best works you can do. The only way He made to get to heaven is through His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by Me. And in Acts 4.12, the Scripture says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus came to this earth. He was born. He lived a perfect, sinless life. The Bible says in Romans 5, 8, But God commendeth His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus took our place on the old rugged cross. He was crucified, buried, and rose again to pay for our sins. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus today offers you a free gift. That gift is eternal life heaven instead of hell. And if today you're willing to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, if you're willing to call on Him today to save you, the Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Romans 10.13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you call on the Lord Jesus Christ right now to be your Savior? If you will, He promised He would save you. Feel free to contact us with any questions. We want to help you 
Grow in your walk with Jesus Christ. God bless you.